All right, it looks like most of us are ready. In our Bible study, we've been talking about how the Bible is written, not looking at outside sources, but just looking at what the Bible says about itself. And we've gotten to one of the best parts of the Bible, which is the Gospels. So last week, we started talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the the four books of the Bible that tell us about Jesus' life. And we spent some time thinking about those books and who wrote them and what we can learn about them, and we're going to continue that today. But of course, we should remember what we talked about last week. I know not all, all of you were here, but some of you were. And so, let's see what we can remember. Which of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which of them tell us who their author is? None of them do. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, none of those four books say this book was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So how do we know who wrote the Gospels? From early church leaders. Exactly. And so there's writings of early Christian leaders from like the 100s and the 200s. And they're they're unanimous in saying, well, there's these four books that are inspired by the Holy Spirit and tell us about Jesus' life. And they're written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so that's where we have to look to see who wrote these books. Okay, are those early church leaders reliable? Yes. Yes. Right? We're careful to say not everything they wrote. It's not like they're writing God's Word. But on something like this, for them to say, we have these four books and we know who wrote them and here's the evidence why, seems to be pretty reliable. All right, last time we talked about Matthew and Mark. Right? Can you tell me some things that we know about Matthew? He was a tax collector. Good. Good. The book he wrote his book for Jewish people, Jewish believers. Good. Something else about Matthew? He went by the name Levi. And so we talked last time that sometimes we hear Matthew and sometimes Levi. It's clear it's the same person. He's called by Jesus. He was called by Jesus to be Jesus' disciple. Excellent. We filled up the three little bullets. That's all you have to do. Right? How about what are some characteristics of his gospel? Gospel of Matthew. What is maybe unique about it or noteworthy about it compared with the other Gospels? It's not the shortest. But save that for the next one. All right? Is that one the next time? So, one thing that's noteworthy about the Gospel of Matthew is it's the first one. And we're not sure why it seems like the early Christians put the books in the order that they did. But clearly, there was something about it that led those early Christians to say, of these four Gospels, we're going to put Matthew first. Okay, Joe mentioned that it was written for Jewish believers. And if it's written for Jewish believers, what would you expect to find in it? Lots of the Old Testament. So the Gospel of Matthew is constantly saying, well, this is just like it was written. This is to fulfill what the prophets said, as it is written. That's all over in Matthew. Just page through it and you would find lots of quotations of Old Testament Bible verses. Is that enough? All right. How about the next one? Mark. What can you tell me about Mark himself? He was not a disciple. So he was not one of Jesus' 12 disciples. Good. He lived at the same time as Jesus and as Paul. And who else did he hang out with? Peter and Silas. Who, and who was his cousin? That's the last one he just said was his cousin. Barnabas. Barnabas. So that's a memorable name, isn't it? Right? So Mark is not a disciple of Jesus. He lives at the same time as Jesus. He's a cousin of a guy named Barnabas who is is well known in the Bible. He traveled some with Paul, but he mostly spent time with Peter. 
There was one kind of noteworthy thing that we heard about between Mark and Paul. What did Mark do when he was traveling around with Paul? He deserted him. And so Mark traveled with Paul on Paul's first missionary trip, and along the way he, he deserted him and went home. And obviously he matured from that and grew up from that. All right, so that's Mark. What are some characteristics of Mark's gospel? Leah, you had something to say. It's the shortest one. Yeah, you're right. It's the shortest of the gospels is Mark, by far. Okay, we said, well, Mark's not a disciple, but we mentioned that people seem to think that Mark spent a lot of time with a disciple who, who really influenced him as he wrote this gospel. Which one? Peter. 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 So those early, early Christian pastors, they said, well, the second gospel is written by Mark, and Mark was highly influenced by Peter. So it's a little bit like this is Peter's perspective on Jesus. Okay, what kind of stories does Mark focus on? We mentioned this last time. It's the shortest gospel. All the impactful stories, the action stories. So Mark doesn't have a lot of Jesus teaching in it. Right? If you want to find the Sermon on the Mount, it's not in Mark. There's not long sermons. There's just look at Jesus did this, and then Jesus did this, and then Jesus did this, and when we think about Peter in the Bible, what kind of a person does Peter seem to be? Impulsive. And like, I like, just do this and this and this. And get a little bit rash sometimes. And so we're not saying that the Gospel of Mark is rash or impulsive, but it seems to have this, let's just get, get on with it, right? Here's a story, and here's a story, and here's a story, and that's kind of the way Mark is. And so some people really like that. I know some people, the Gospel of Mark is their favorite Gospel, right? It, Feels like you're moving fast. And Jesus does this, and he does this. And there's a lot of action in it. You did a good job. You remembered some things today. That's good. You can add that. So the guy named Mark also was named John. Sometimes he's called John Mark. Let's go on. There's two more Gospels. Today we're going to talk about the Gospel of Luke and John. So with each Gospel, we've been starting with these two questions. True or false? Luke was one of the twelve disciples of Jesus. False. He was not. Okay, we said this is kind of unexpected. Mark wasn't a twelve of the twelve disciples either. How about true or false? Luke. So the name Luke is mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. False. We don't hear a single thing about Luke in the whole Gospel of Luke. You could search the Gospel for the name Luke and you won't find it at all. Alright, so let's read some places from the Bible to see what we can find out about Luke. Starting in Luke. So open up to the Gospel of Luke. And look at how the Gospel of Luke starts. It has a unique introduction that's different than the other Gospels. So Luke chapter 1. And he's got an introduction before he even talks about Jesus. Right? It says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. That's how it starts. Just from those four verses, what are some things we can learn about the author of this book? It doesn't say his name. We don't get to learn his name. But what can we learn about the person writing this book? Dave? 
He's scholarly. Right? He seems to be kind of a scholarly, academic type person. He, he likes to research things. He's going to read, kind of like a doctor. Okay, just hold that thought for a little while. He carefully investigated it. He decided he's going to write it. And he investigates it. Okay, all right, there's something noteworthy, especially about the investigation part. Whom did he make a point to talk to? What type of people did he talk to? Eyewitnesses. And so what does it seem like the author of this book was not? An he's not an eyewitness. He doesn't start the gospel by saying, I'm going to write to you about the things that I have seen. No, he starts by saying, I'm going to write to you about these things that I have thoroughly investigated. And what kind of an account is he going to write? Orderly. An orderly account. Okay, why does that kind of stand out? Maybe it doesn't. For us today, we expect an orderly account. But often when you read the Bible, you'll notice that were Bible authors always um, interested in what the, the chronology of things are? Does it have to all be in chron chronological order? No, they jump around. No, they would kind of jump around. Often they'd write more thematically, like, well, here's something about this and this, and now we'll move on to this. And, but Luke says, I'm going to write an orderly account, kind of from beginning to end. About Jesus. This makes sense? Okay, and so it kind of fits with this is written by someone who wasn't a disciple of Jesus, who wasn't there with him all the time, but who's certainly a believer in God and led by the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm going to study these things and write down a very orderly account of the, the events of Jesus' life. Questions about that? So when we get later on, we're going to write down characteristics of Luke's gospel. And one of them that you could put down would be thorough and orderly. All right? Which gospel tells us about Jesus' birth in Bethlehem? You want to say all of them, but not all of them. Which is the one that tells us about the shepherds and the angels? Just Luke. You know, like Christmas Eve, and maybe the kids talk about there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. And the only one who tells us about that is Luke. Right? Who tells us about the angel Gabriel going to Mary? Just Luke. Right? When you get to the end of Jesus' life, which gospel tells us how Jesus ascended into heaven? Catching on here a little bit. <laughs> Just Luke. And so the Gospel of Luke has the most complete from beginning to end story of Jesus' life. Right? From the angel appearing to Mary to Jesus' birth all the way to Jesus ascending into heaven. If you want the, the whole thing just orderly arranged, then you should read the Gospel of Luke. Right? Let's read some other places, but not in Luke. We have to turn to the book of Acts. So if you're in Luke, you're just going ahead two books. Luke, Acts, Luke, John, Acts. There we go. So skip over John and go to Acts. <clears throat> and notice how the book of Acts starts. So we're just thinking, what can we learn about this author of God's Word? Acts also has a little introduction to it, kind of like Luke does. So Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Just stop there. What do we learn about the person who wrote Luke? He also wrote Acts. Right? The same author wrote both books, and he dedicates them both to the same person. We didn't mention this before, but he actually wrote Luke and Acts for a person. 
Who did he write it for? Theophilus, and we don't know who Theophilus is. The name itself means lover of God. So some people have suggested maybe it wasn't the actual person. It was for any lover of God these books are written for. I think most Bible scholars would say that's probably not the case. It was probably an actual person named Theophilus, whom Luke is writing this for. But the same person writes Luke and Acts, and Acts is just a continuation of Luke. What did I just tell you that Luke ends with? The ascension of Jesus. What do you think Acts starts with? The ascension of Jesus. Why not just put them together in one book? You know the answer. What was the answer? It would have been too long. Okay, remember? They're on these scrolls. And you just can't have it be too long. And Luke and Acts are both very long books. And so it's the same story. Right? But broken up into two books. So we can carry it around better and use it more easily. All right, we're in the book of Acts. Go ahead and Acts to chapter 16. We're going to read what's going to seem like some very random verses. But there's a reason for it. Acts chapter 16, starting with verse 6. Okay, I'm going to read this, and you, you try to figure out what this teaches us about Luke. Okay, so in Acts chapter 16, Paul, the missionary, is on one of his mission journeys. And we're just going to hear some details about one of his mission journeys. So Acts chapter 16, starting with verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Some very detailed travel plans. So Paul, he wants to keep spreading the gospel around Turkey. That was the province of Asia. But as he tries to travel around Turkey, what happens? The Holy Spirit prevents it. We don't know how this works, but somehow the Holy Spirit said, Paul, not there right now. Not there. Instead, God gives him a dream of somebody from where? Macedonia, which is which country today? Greece. Which is quite a, a big thing, because what's the difference between Turkey and Greece? They're different continents. All right, and so God calling Paul to go to Macedonia, it's like the first time the gospel is making it out of Asia, where Israel is, into Europe. And so it's a pretty big deal. But none of that's why we're reading this. What does this have to do with the person who wrote Luke and Acts? Did you notice? Something happens in verse 10 that doesn't happen in the whole first 15 chapters of Acts. What word is used in verse 10 all of a sudden? We. we. Did you notice that? Maybe you did. Right? All of a sudden, it doesn't say they. It says we. All right? And so whoever wrote the book of Luke and Acts, where does he start traveling with Paul from? Close. Troas. Troas. So somehow the author of this book meets up with Paul in Troas, and from there he starts traveling with him. You found this? All right? And so when you read the gospel, the, gospel, the book of Acts, you can kind of pay attention to, does it say we or does it say they? And you can pick up on when is the author of the book actually part of the stories. 
And when is he not? All right, we could do this all day, but let's just go to the end of the book. See how Acts ends, chapter 28. And let's just read a little bit of the last chapter of Acts and see where the book ends up. Acts chapter 28, starting with verse 11. Sounds like we're there. Acts 28, 11. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that wintered on the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there we set sail and arrived in Regium. The next day the south wind came up, and on the following day we reached Puteoli. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself and a soldier to guard him. So at the end of the book of Acts, where does Paul finally make it to? Rome, Rome which of course is the big capital city of the Roman Empire. It's a place Paul had often talked about going. He finally makes it there. And who must be traveling with him? Luke. We. It says we, right? And what's Paul's condition when he gets there? He's a captive, a prisoner. And so the, the, the book of Luke, keep mixing, the book of Acts ends with Paul in Rome, but he's not in a prison. He's chained up kind of in a private house on guard. And that's how it ends. And apparently, the author of Acts is there with him. Make sense? All right, here's a couple more places that Luke has mentioned in the rest of the New Testament. Colossians chapter 4 says, Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Alright, now, this is a little bit of background information, but do you know where Paul was when he wrote Colossians? He was chained up in what city? Rome! And who was there with him? Luke. And what's Luke's profession? Doctor. He's a doctor. Does this kind of fit with what we've read about the author of Luke and Acts? Yeah. An educated man who likes to investigate and research things, and he travels with Paul and ends up in Rome with him when he's in prison. All right, here's a, a, some verses from Philemon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke my fellow workers. And so what's Paul's condition as he writes Philemon? Still a prisoner. Still a prisoner. And who's there working with him? Still Luke. Still Luke. Some other people too. But still Luke. All right. So we make all these connections. It really, really <coughs> makes sense that Luke is the one who writes Luke and Acts. And the last one, 2 Timothy, seems to be the last part of the Bible that Paul writes. And when he writes 2 Timothy, he's no longer under house arrest. He, it seems like he's in a dungeon, and he knows he's going to die. And so 2 Timothy is Paul writing his last letter, convinced he's going to die. And look at whom he mentions. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. And so as he's convinced he's going to die, he's about to be executed, who's the only one who's left with Paul in Rome? Luke. It's kind of sad that, notice, these other two passages mention one other person. Demas. There's Demas. Here's Demas. What does Demas end up doing? Deserting. Deserting. 
and it seems like a bad thing. The other two, Crescens and Titus, we don't hear a bad thing. It seems like they just they just moved on. They're doing work somewhere else. But Luke is the one who, at the end of Paul's life, he obviously wasn't chained up in the dungeon with Paul, but he was there in Rome taking care of him as he prepares to be executed. This is what the Bible tells us about Luke. Yes. In the last two things that you cited, the Mark is mentioned, or is that the same yeah. gospel writer? That's the same gospel writer. Yep. We actually read this verse last week when we talked about Mark 2. And so Mark has this interesting story where he grows up, obviously, in a strong Christian family, goes with Paul on his missionary journey and deserts him. And then when Paul wants to go on his second trip, Barnabas says, let's bring Mark along again. And Paul says, no, he's a deserter. We're not going to bring him along. Right? So Paul and Barnabas split ways. Barnabas goes one direction with Mark. Paul goes another direction with Silas. But after years go by, clearly that Mark regains Paul's, Paul's trust and his confidence. And so at the end of Paul's life, a decade later, um, he writes to Timothy, come and see me and bring Mark with you. Because he's helpful. He's actually helpful. Yes? How old is Paul at this time? How old is Paul at this time? <laughs> so, um, when people try to find out chronology in the New Testament, right? Um, when, when we read the end of the book of Acts, this trip where Paul goes and he's imprisoned in, under house arrest in Rome. Um, Bible scholars try to pinpoint that. And if I remember right, it's about the years like 60 to 62 AD. Okay, he's in prison for at least a couple of years. Not, not in prison, he's chained up in house arrest. Right? And this is where the, the book of Acts stops. And Acts is so helpful because that's the actual history book that tells us the history. The rest of the New Testament, it focuses more on doctrine and teaching and not, well, this is what Paul was doing every step of the way. So the historical record stops with Paul's under house arrest in Rome. It seems like Paul gets released from what we hear in his letters. And it seems like he's free to travel around some more. And then it seems like he gets arrested again. And the second time, he's not under house arrest, he's in a prison. And he knows that he's going to die. And so if he's in Rome from 60 to 62, if there's a couple of years of freedom, and I think when people pinpoint when was Paul executed, it was in 66 or 68 AD. And same with Peter, it's another story, but Peter and Paul both end up in Rome and are executed. That's not in the Bible. That's again what early Christian pastors tell us. So then you try to say, well, how old would Paul have been in 66 or 68 AD? And that's what we can't say with certainty. The Bible doesn't tell us when he was born. I guess for me, I kind of imagine Paul is probably born about the same time that Jesus was. Because after Jesus is ascended to heaven, Paul seems to be there, already a man. He's trained as a Pharisee. And so he must have been similar in age to Jesus. And by the time he starts being a Christian missionary, that's about the late 40s to 50 AD. So he has maybe 20 years where he's traveling around. And so, you know, you imagine somebody who must have been 30 to 40 years old, and he starts traveling around for another 20 years. And so, I don't know that we can say with certainty, but by 68 AD, when he dies, he's not 30 years old. He's probably also not 90 years old. He's probably in the in his 50s or 60s years old. I think that's what Bible scholars would mostly say. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I mean, one of the disciples was Andrew, was it, was killed early? On? James was killed early on. So, in the... So James is the, the only one of Jesus' 12 disciples that we hear in the Bible about his death is James. And he was beheaded in Jerusalem pretty early on. So the rest of the disciples and Paul, we, we hear about them in the writings of early church fathers. Okay, 
we don't believe everything that those people wrote, but they, they do have some pretty consistent traditions about this person did this and this person did that. Great question. Terry. I, uh, <clears throat> I gotta look at this again. Because I got, let's see, uh, two New Testament books and six Old Testament people. And Paul and Peter, uh, New Testament ones, had something wrong with a short little book on them. Uh, and published it, and I bought it out of Northwestern Publishing House. Company. I gotta go back and look and see if they tell what year come close. Excellent. Terry's mentioning that our, our publishing house, or the publishing house, there's, there's a little book about Paul and a little book about Peter. <laughs> and uh, it's called A Portrait of Paul and A Portrait of Peter. Sorry. And so if you're interested in reading more about one of those two, uh, you can you can find a book and find out more. But we're really talking about Luke, right? Right? This is how I want to end our time with Luke. Even though the Gospel of Luke is similar to Matthew and Mark, we said Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar, there are a number of stories that are found only in Luke. I have listed ten different things, I think. Maybe nine. Nine or ten. Right? I want you to look these up. You don't have to read the whole story. Okay. Maybe what it'll do is it'll motivate you to read the Gospel of Luke. Right? Just start with these five that I have on the screen, with the people around you, in your Bible, take note of these places in the Gospel of Luke, and write down stories that we only hear from Luke. Right? So do these five first. Take a couple minutes and see what you find. All right, maybe you didn't make it through all of them, but just so that you know you're on the right track, let's just... I'm sorry. Let's, let's see. So chapter 1, I just have the whole chapter up there. Because everything in Luke chapter 1 is found only in Luke. Like what stories? Zechariah and Elizabeth, right? John the Baptist's parents. And the angel appearing to Zechariah. What, what, what's after them? Uh, John the Baptist. The Gabriel appearing to Mary. Mary going to visit Elizabeth. John the Baptist being born. 
These are all things that we only hear about in Luke. That's it. Right? And then they got chapter 2. And it's the whole chapter. What's in chapter 2? The birth of Jesus. Now, Matthew mentions very briefly the birth of Jesus. But the whole thing about Bethlehem and the manger and the shepherds and the angels, that's only in the Gospel of Luke. None of the other Gospels mention that. Huh? I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but on, on uh, Luke 10, he uh, has like he's traveling with Jesus, but you said he wasn't an eyewitness. So is he speaking with an eyewitness on the birth of Christ? So, so as you go through Luke, the Gospel of Luke, right? I don't know that there's any place that it's going to say we. Right? Right. It's all he. And so Luke, Luke never, never puts himself into the story. But obviously, he's telling the stories right. as someone who knows what happened there. And this is where we know he's he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh-huh. and he's done his research and talked to eyewitnesses. Okay. And so that's how he's, he's writing down stories from Jesus' life. He never puts himself there. He doesn't say, well, I was there, and Jesus did this. He says, Jesus did this. Right. And our confidence is the Holy Spirit is guiding him. And he's told us, just humanly speaking, he's 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 interviewed and researched and found out exactly what happened. Okay? I also noticed I put this up here twice, so that was an accident. The same thing is up there twice. But since you brought it up, Holly, what story is in Luke 10, 29 to 37? The Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. You heard of that one before? Okay, that's only in the Gospel of Luke. Kind of surprisingly. Alright, you guys keep going. Go through to the, the rest of the places that I've cited. So chapter 15 and then all these more. But you're on the right track. Just notice these different stories that you know that we only hear about in Luke. All right, it's great to see you pacing around in the Bible. Maybe you didn't make it through the whole list, but I bet some of you did. All right, Luke 15. What's in Luke chapter 15, 11 to 32? 
the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son. We only hear about that in the Gospel of Luke. How about 1631 to 1931? You know that story, right? Where there's the rich man and poor Lazarus, and they both die, and the rich man goes to hell, and Lazarus goes to heaven. And we just find that in Luke. How about Luke 17, 11 to 19? Let me reveal one thank God. The ten lepers. And only one comes back to thank God. It's often what we'll read in church on Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving time. The, the need to give thanks to God for his blessings. How about Luke 18, 9 to 14? The Pharisee and the tax collector. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. They both go to the temple. The Pharisee says, God, I thank you. I'm not like all these other people. Thanks for me being so good. I'm really good. And the tax collector beats his chest and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We usually read that on one day. What day do we read that parable on? Every year. <laughs> Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. That's often what Christians will read in church on Ash Wednesday. Just to, this encouragement to humbly repent. Not to be that Pharisee, but to repent like the tax collector. All right, Luke 19. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. You've heard about him. The short guy, right? That's just in the Gospel of Luke. And at the end of the Gospel, Luke 24, on Easter, what do we hear about on Easter that we don't hear about other places? So the two, walking with the two men on the way to Emmaus, on Easter Sunday, Jesus walks with these two men and explains how he's fulfilled all the prophecies of Scripture. And, all right, and so it, you know that the gospel, sometimes people ask, well, why do we have four different gospels? And there's a lot of stories that aren't the same. Why do we have all four? Because each one, by God's plan, gives us a different perspective and adds different stories and it adds to our, our, our understanding of Jesus and his grace for us. And when I think about Luke, think of how many of these unique accounts in Luke really focus on the heart of the Bible's message about sin and God's grace. Right? And so you think the parable of the Good Samaritan. Okay? Is that law or gospel? The parable of the Good Samaritan is some of the strongest law in the whole Bible. Because what's the message of the parable of the Good Samaritan? The man asks Jesus, who's my neighbor? And what's the answer? Everyone. Everyone. And the man who asked Jesus was pretty self-righteous, thinking, you know, I'm pretty good. I've been doing just about everything God says. And what did that parable of the Good Samaritan teach him? No, you're not. No, you're not. You need somebody to save you. Right? This is at the heart of the Bible's message. Then you get to the prodigal son. And what does the prodigal son teach us about? Now you're scared because you got the last one wrong. Right? There's a chance you might get this one right, even though you got the last one wrong. Grace. Grace. And so no matter what your life has been like, no matter if you've fallen away from God or run away from God or lived a sinful life when when you repent and come back to God, what does he do? He welcomes you with open arms and he forgives you. All right, and you think of the rich man and Lazarus. You want a story that just shows the two options in life. There's either following God or not. And when you die, there's just two options. What are they? Heaven, heaven and hell. You remember the rich man in hell, he says to, to Abraham in heaven, he says, send somebody back from the dead to tell my brothers so they don't have to come here to hell. And remember what Abraham says? Yes, you have Moses and the prophets, which means you have God's word. You have God's word. And he says, that's not enough. Have somebody rise from the dead and have them go in. And Abraham said, they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, it won't matter. Even if someone rises from the dead, if you have God's word, you have everything that you need to be saved and have eternal life. All right, I talked about the Pharisee and the tax collector. That's what we do on Ash Wednesday. The story of Zacchaeus, 
right? We think of it as this cute story of the little guy, right? And Jesus loves little people too, which is good, <laughs> right? But the story of Zacchaeus, what was Zacchaeus' job? Tax collector. Tax collector. How do people feel about tax collectors? They're the worst, right? They're the worst people. And yet of all the crowds of people around Jesus, whom does Jesus pick out to talk to? The tax collector. And he goes and eats at his house. And he changes his heart and his life. And the end of that story says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And that's what Jesus came to do, right? To seek and to save what was lost. And so I just think it's unique in the Gospel of Luke. There's all these unique stories, and so many of them focus right on the heart of the Bible's message about how we're sinful, and Jesus came to seek and to save us, and there's hope in God's grace. So, what are some characteristics of the Gospel of Luke? Grace. Stories of God's grace that we don't find other places. Of course, God's grace is everywhere in the Bible, but the parable of the lost son. Or the forgiveness. The parable of the tax collector being forgiven. The real story of Zacchaeus. Right? God's grace shines out in the Gospel of Luke. Something else? It's thorough. So you just, I want from beginning to end of Jesus' life, the most thorough gospel, mentioning all the different stories, probably would be the gospel of Luke. Something else? Chronological, good, orderly. I was going to say, we all like Christmas. So, the Christmas story is in the Gospel of Luke. That's where you go. And I know some of you are excited because we passed June 25th, so that means we're closer to Christmas in the other way. So, you're thinking about your tree and everything. This, you think of Christmas, think of the Gospel of Luke. All right, any questions about Luke? All right, there's one more gospel, the Gospel of John. We might not make it all the way through this, but we can make it through some of it. So, true or false, John was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. Yes. True. He was. So Matthew and John of the four gospels, they're from disciples of Jesus. The disciple whom Jesus loved, which gets us into the next question. John is mentioned in yes. the Gospel of John. Yes. False. The Gospel of John never uses the name John. So it uses the name John for John the Baptist. But John, the disciple of Jesus, is not mentioned in the Gospel of John. I mean, the person is, but the name John, that's what I'm trying to say. Don't yeah. The name John is not used in the Gospel of John. Right? And this is kind of, kind of fascinating. So we got some stories to read. They're all from John this time. So in the Gospel of John, open to John chapter 1, verse 35. So John chapter 1, verse 35. Okay, here's a story about Jesus calling his disciples. And we're going to think about who it's talking about. It says, the next day, John was there. Now, this is not John the disciple. This is John the Baptist. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus by, passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. 
Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and would follow Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. So John the Baptist had his own disciples, he had his own followers, but John the Baptist's job was to point to Jesus. So whenever he saw Jesus, he would point his followers to Jesus. Two of those followers start following Jesus. We hear the name of one of them. Andrew. Andrew. Right? And Andrew immediately goes and tells his brother, who is Simon Peter. So the other one was not Simon Peter. And so we try to think to ourselves, who was the other guy with Andrew? But does the author of John mention the other guy's name? No. All right, keep your finger here. It says compare it with Matthew chapter 4. So keep your finger here in John. Turn back to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. Okay, now, this isn't the exact same story, but we're going to notice some similarities. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. It says, Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now I said that's not exactly the same story, okay? but the Gospels are pretty consistent. As Jesus calls his first disciples, there are two sets of brothers. Who are the two sets of brothers? Andrew and Peter, and James and John. James and John. And so I think just about any Bible scholar, for the story in John about two disciples of John following Jesus, one is the, the Andrew, the brother of Peter. Most people would say the other one must be John. But notice that John doesn't say the other guy's name was John, and his brother was James. And if you read the whole Gospel of John, you don't hear about John. All right? Here's some more examples. Turn ahead in John to John 13. John 13, we've made it to Holy Week. It's Monday, Thursday. The disciples and Jesus are in the upper room having the Passover meal. Here's one of the things that the Gospel of John tells us about it. So John chapter 13, starting with verse 18. Jesus is talking. He says, I'm not referring to all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of the disciples, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It's the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered. So this is a familiar story. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. And on Monday, Thursday night, he tells his disciples, one of you will betray me. 
And they didn't know what he was talking about because they don't have the benefit of hindsight like we do to know how it all happened. But who ends up asking Jesus who it is? John. Well, it doesn't say that. What does it say? The disciple Jesus loved. Right? And where was he sitting at that table? Right next, right next to Jesus. And Peter kind of motions to him, ask him. And he asks him. And Jesus said, well, Judas. Judas Iscariot is the one who's going to betray him. Okay? This is the first time in John that we hear this phrase, the disciple whom he loved. All right? Let's go ahead a little bit. Turn to chapter 19, which is just one day later, but it's six chapters further on. So now Jesus is on the cross. It's Good Friday. John 19, verses 25 to 28. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said, Well, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And so you're familiar that it seems like on Good Friday, very few of the disciples were with Jesus. They abandoned him and fled, including Peter. Peter had tried to take along and then denied Jesus, and then he ran away. It seems like there was only one disciple who was actually at Jesus' cross. The people who were there were, were the women, the faithful women who were his followers, including his mother. And on the cross, Jesus tells someone to take care of his mother. Whom does he tell to take care of his mother? Well, it doesn't say that. What does it say? The disciple whom he loved. And so it seems like right, John is the one disciple who's at Jesus' cross. Jesus tells John to take care of Mary. All right, go a little further. Next chapter. Now it's Easter. Chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. <laughs> he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came up along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. And so on Easter morning, Mary is the first one at the tomb, not the disciples. She goes back and says, he's gone. And there's two disciples who kind of seem to be like the leaders of the disciples, right? And they take off going, and one of them's named, which one? Peter. Peter. Notice we're hearing about Peter again and again. But then there's somebody who's always with Peter, and who is it? The disciple whom he loved. All right? And He's faster. He's definitely faster. <laughs> right? So John is faster than Peter. This is where there's that Facebook meme that it's Easter morning and John beats Peter to the tomb. And John says, ah, I'm faster than you. And Peter said, who's going to know? And John says, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Right? And it's the same one. Disciple who whom he loves. All right? There's another place we got to go to. Next chapter. Here's where we hear it's, it's after Easter now, and Jesus does something special for Peter to let Peter know that he's forgiven. 
But this disciple whom he loves shows up in the same story. Right? Here's how the Gospel of John ends. So chapter 21, right? there just was this miraculous catch of fish. The disciples were fishing. Jesus was on the shore making them breakfast. They come to the shore. Here's what happens. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Okay, this is a pretty powerful thing. Remember how many times Peter had denied Jesus? Three times. And so it seems like Jesus is walking that back. And he gives Peter the chance three times to say that he loves him and believes in him. Okay, this must have been hard for Peter. Okay, but you could see Peter's mind going back to that night when he betrayed Jesus. Now Jesus gives him the chance three times to say, yes, Lord, I, I love you. And then Jesus tells Peter that he's going to die for being his follower. Which sounds like an awful thing, but in the moment, it would have actually been some comforting words for Peter. What was Jesus really saying to Peter, who had denied Jesus three times? What was he saying? You're forgiven. The next time, you're not going to deny me. The next time, you're even going to let someone put you to death for my sake. You think, what a powerful thing. All right, Peter, you're forgiven, and I want you to know that at the end of your life, you're not going to deny me. I'm going to make you strong to face what you have to face. And the Bible doesn't tell us how Peter died, other than this, that his arms are going to be stretched out. I think you know the tradition about Peter's death. What did the early church pastors say? That he was crucified upside down for his for being a follower of Jesus. And according to the story. He, he, he was going to be crucified, and he actually asked to be crucified upside down because he said, I don't want to be crucified the same way Jesus was. I don't deserve that. And the Romans were happy to make it even worse and have him be upside down. Right? So that's Peter. But notice how, how now the disciple Jesus loves is going to show up. Verse 20. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. That's where it ends. And so, again, this disciple whom Jesus loves shows up. He's kind of there with Peter. And Peter says, well, is he going to die too? And Jesus says, it doesn't matter. Right? Follow me. Okay, and so there was this rumor that John was going to live forever, and John says, that's not what Jesus said. He didn't say I was going to not die. He just said, well, what was it to you if he dies or not? And who is it who writes the Gospel of John then? It's this disciple whom Jesus loves. All right? Let's end with this. Why do you think John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. So it seems like he wants to be anonymous, although I think anybody reading it knows who it is, but he purposely isn't putting his name in there. It's on purpose. 
because the other Gospels mention John all the time. It seems like, like maybe it was because he was humble. Who's the Gospel of John about? Jesus. Jesus. Who did John want to get all the attention in the Gospel of John? Jesus. Jesus. And when John <laughs> thought about himself, right, what was his identity? I am loved by Jesus. Right? If you want to know who wrote this book, it was written by someone who was loved by Jesus. It's really all that matters. By name, it doesn't matter. Right? John does not include the story of calling James and John from being fishermen. The other Gospels tell us that. John doesn't. Okay? It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And I think this is cool. What implications does that have for us today? Who are you? I'm, I'm the person loved by Jesus. You could even say I'm the disciple loved by Jesus, right? You're not one of the 12 disciples, but you're Jesus' follower. Okay, isn't that just a great mindset for a believer in God to have? Who am I? Well, I'm, I'm the one Jesus loves. And, you know, if you look at this phrase, it's not saying that Jesus necessarily loved John more than the other disciples, right? It doesn't say the disciple Jesus loved most. It doesn't say the only disciple Jesus loved. It just says the disciple Jesus loved. Right? What could all of those 12 disciples say about themselves? Jesus loved. I'm the disciple Jesus. This is what you can think about yourself. Right? As you go through life, even more important than your name or your gender or your occupation or your family is just to take this I am, the disciple Jesus loves. That's who I am. And that doesn't change. Right? It's kind of cool to see. This is how John talks about himself in the Gospel of John. We got a couple more things to mention about John. We'll do that next Sunday. So come back next week. Glad you could be here today. Let's say a prayer. You know, Jesus, it's a blessing to see how you're able to use so many different people uh, to do your work. We see that just in the writers of the Gospels. Matthew was a tax collector. Mark was a young man who deserted Paul, and, and yet you used him to write down your word. Luke was a doctor. John was a fisherman and your disciple. And reminds us of how you use all of us to do your will, too. We pray that you use our unique gifts and talents and our place in life to, to serve you Especially ended today by thinking of how John was the disciple whom you loved. That was his identity. We want that to be our identity too. That regardless of what else we do or who it seems we are in life, help us to remember we are loved by you. That's what makes each one of us special. I pray that you keep growing our desire to, to, to read and to study and to know your word. And through it, give us more faith in you. In your name we pray. Amen.